So what is a disciple? We just, we just heard a little bit on that uh, video testimony about discipleship and what that looks like. Um, do you remember who taught you how to ride your bike? There's, there's significant core memories that we have that we will never forget where that influence came from. Do you remember when and how that happened? Things like trying to study. I remember specifics. Like I remember my little toes barely touching the ground. I remember the training wheels coming off, helping my dad take the training wheels off. I remember those, like the, the conversations we had. He's like, you're going to wreck. You're going to skin yourself up. It's going to hurt. I remember the details of that. <laughs> I fell a lot. If you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough, right? Um, what about how to play a musical instrument? Do you, do you remember? I know you do. If you have a passion for music and you play an instrument, I know you remember who, you, who introduced you to music. Who was that pivotal influence in your life that pointed you in that direction? What did they say? I know you remember it. You, you, uh, you sports fans out there, do you remember who pushed you to get into sports, to, 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 to spark that interest in your mind about competition? I know you do. <laughs> you math nerds out there, do you remember who taught you how to read fractions? How to do algebra. Do you remember who it was that took the time to sit you down and walk through that and spark that curiosity, spark that fire in you? Me neither. <laughs> How about this one? Who taught you to be defensive when you were verbally attacked? It's not, it's, it, that's not one to be super proud of, right? When was that lesson learned? Do you remember who taught you your, your responses to conflict, really? Who taught you that you really need all the stuff that's in your room or your house? Do you remember who it was that taught you to be afraid of offending other people by telling the truth? Who was it that taught you about the importance of wearing the right clothes for the right occasion? of having the right friends or getting the right job. When was your first lesson in lying or lust? Who was it that taught you about selfishness or slander? Folks, when it comes to some of our fun most fundamental attitudes and perspectives, pinpointing when and where, and from whom we learn these things. When we, when we really look back on those things, finding out where those things come from sometimes can seem impossible. Don't misunderstand me. If we believe that God has said in his word, what he has said in his word, then we know that all of these attitudes result from the presence and power of sin within us, of, 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 of sin in this world as well, you know. But just like clay is shaped and formed by an artist's hands, so too is the sin inside us that shapes us by a variety of outside forces. I'd like to keep, I would like us to keep these ideas in mind. As we get into today's scriptures out of Luke chapter 6, we're only going to be mulling over two verses today. And we've all read them. Well, most of us have read them numerous times. But there's a lot to glean from here. And it's uh, verses 39 and 40. But before we get into the scripture, let's go ahead and pray. Oh, Lord. You are funny. You, uh, 
You take the broken, you make them whole. You transform the worst of the worst into mighty warriors for your kingdom. Faithful followers, faithful disciples of yours. And we thank you for that. Lord, as we, as we dig into this message, illuminate the areas of our lives that, that you want us to work on, man. And, and just move, soften hearts, open ears, open eyes. Move mountains today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we will be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 39. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Folks, Jesus here, as he often did, uses this parable or, or this example to, to drive home his point. And, and this parable in Luke 6 is, is so short. Most of, us, most of us miss this little tiny parable, but it, 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 it indeed is a parable. <clears throat> Sorry. Jesus tells, tells us, us, his listeners, wouldn't it be absolutely ridiculous for a blind man to try to lead another blind man? Think about that real fast. Around, let's, let's think about, you, have you, you guys know Frogger, right? The game? Traffic gone, you know, the Frogger's trying to get across in the lanes. Could you imagine a busy highway and two blind folks trying to lead each other across that? Sounds kind of ridiculous, right? He's not giving advice on the visually impaired here. He, he's driving home a larger point, he, and he's making this point with this specific parable. Well, and if we look at, it a sec, at the second verse of, of these two, it becomes clear that the issue here is guidance. The thread connecting these two verses in this, in, in this is the thread of discipleship. But what is a disciple? Disciple is one of those words that we hear thrown around in churches. Well, uh, yeah, I, I believe Jesus is real. Uh, yeah, uh, you can call me a disciple, I guess. No. I mean, it's, it's, it's a word that's lost its meaning, truly. It's been cheapened down and dumbed down to the point where, unfortunately, as you heard the guy, it's... It's, it's lost its meaning. It's, it's almost a useless word, unfortunately. But if asked to explain the word discipleship, most of us, a lot of us would probably struggle. We may struggle to spell out the importance of it, the, the, the implications behind the premise of discipleship. So what is it? What does God's word tell us? And why is it so important? So I, I, I shared with you that I wrote that this, is, this was right after the Sermon on the Mount. And those lessons that we learned in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking to his disciples specifically. And, and all of those lessons are about discipleship. Every single one of them, if you read the Sermon on the Mount through the lens of discipleship, you will see that thread woven all the way through it. Therefore, it's critical when we hear these lessons with the ears of a disciple. But to do that, it's important that we can answer the question based on on our own scripturally informed conviction. So what is a disciple? Again, the Greek word that we translate here is mathetes. 
And it is used 261 times in the New Testament alone. 261 times. That's not a huge portion of the Bible, guys. In translating Luke 640, the NIV translates this word as student. The NASB, it's, it's much the same, it's pupil. So the translation, the, it's, it's pretty consistent across the board. Along those lines, I think in light of how the New Testament uses this word, we could also add the words learner and apprentice. Um, see, discipleship was not unusual in Jesus' time. That's what the rabbis, they discipled the youngsters. They would, they would handpick who they thought had a future, and those youngsters would follow the rabbis around for years. And eventually they would weed out the, well, what they thought was the less, the, 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 the dumber ones of them all. And they would keep the smartest student, and they would become the disciple that they fostered up to sometimes take their own job. We are told both the Pharisees and John the baptizer had these disciples. But why disciples to Jesus? So let's do this. I, I, I brought up three ideas here about discipleship that come right out of these two small passages. The first idea we find is in 39. Here we learn, we learn there that Jesus does mean, what Jesus does mean when he talked about the blind leading the blind. Well, when Matthew quotes this parable in Matthew 15, Jesus explicitly identifies the Pharisees as the blind guides. But in this context, the parable is related to hypocrites who have a critical spirit. Or as we might say, Jesus is talking about those folks that, who are the pots that call the kettle black. When you want to point out another sin without recognizing your own first. But the parable applies in both contexts very well. Because both are about being guided by lies and not truth. Do you see the emphasis in the parable? It, it, it is on the one being led, not the leader. Who is guiding you, asks Jesus, and where are you being led? I put the question to you and to myself this morning, who are we learning from? At whose feet are you sitting throughout the week? Who or what? Has your ear? Who or what formed the shape that you take now? To whom are you looking to for guidance? As I asked at the as I asked you at the beginning of our time together, who was it that taught you to be the way that you are? The writer Dallas Willard asked this same question in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. He says, who teaches you? Whose disciple are you? Honestly, one thing is sure. You are somebody's disciple. You learn how to live from somebody else. There are no ex exceptions to this rule. For human beings are just the kind of creatures that have to learn and keep learning from others on how to live. It's hard to come to realistic terms about this today. <clears throat> Today, especially in Western cultures, we prefer to think that we are our own person. We make up our own minds. But that's only because we have been mastered by those who have taught us that we, that we do or should do. Such individualism is a part of the legacy that makes us modern. But we certainly did not come by that individualistic posture through our own individual and independent insight into ultimate truth. Probably you are the disciple of several somebodies in your life. 
if you think about it, not only are all those looking to be led. Oh, I'm sorry. If, if you think about it, not only are all of, that's a typo. <laughs> I didn't read it wrong. Not only are you guys, are, are we all looking to be led, but all of us have been taught about life in, in a school tainted by sin. Our parents are tainted by sin. Our teachers are tainted by sin. Our siblings. I mean, the list goes on and on. Any influential person in your life is tainted by sin. Our news. Oh, man, this time of year. I get so sucked into it, too. Every single time. This, this politics stuff gets me, man. <sighs> Even the seemingly harm, harmless places we go, the grocery store, the restaurant, the salons, they are all tainted by sin. Everything. We, ha we have been nurtured to act and respond and speak and think in ways that are fleshly. They are carnal. And they are based on the wisdom of this fallen world. Yet, what the world does not know, but we should know, is that Jesus tells us here, blind, friends, the world is blind. The wisdom of the world is blind. And just like the parable teaches, that relationship, it will only end in tragedy. So when we ask again, what is a disciple? We must first admit that all of us, that every person is, that you are, that I am, we are all a disciple of something, someone. But Jesus also reminds us here that, that too, we must recognize the position of the teacher. So in recognizing the position of the teacher, that also helps us recognize our position below the teacher. Again, you heard it on the video. Humility. It's something that's experienced. It's not something that... It, it, it's, it's experiential knowledge. It's hard lessons. The blind guidance of sin of the world, of the flesh, is that you are your own master. You are your own master. It's all about you. I make this decision. I got this. I got that. I got the big job. I got the nice car. I, 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 I. It's all about you. That's what the world teaches us. That you are numero uno in all things. Your feelings are the most important. Your truth is the most important. But as Jesus tells us at the beginning of verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher. As Peter explains in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, for whatever overcomes or rules over or controls a person, to that he is enslaved. If you are guided by fleshly, worldly principles, however subtle they may be, Then, are you, then you are submitting yourself as a slave to sin. But listen to what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 23, verse 8. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. He says you have one teacher. And you are all brothers or ancestors. A disciple of Jesus has one teacher, and our, and our position under that teacher never changes. Yes, we may be tempted to follow other teachers, and we may wonder at times, but God's grace, a disciple, but by God's grace, a disciple of Jesus will return to that singular focus. He or she will ultimately look to Jesus as teacher, capital T. 
You see, the Christian life is a relationship in which we joy, joyfully accept our position as the perpetual student and Jesus as the perpetual teacher. Is that how you think about your relationship with him? Is he creator? Yes. Is he king? Definitely. Is he redeemer? Of course. Is he high priest, mediator? Yes, he is. He is the God. He is the, the God, the son. Yes, but he is teacher. Do you look at him as a teacher? Through that lens, with that lens, we can begin a submissive mindset to following Jesus. And that brings us to this third point. Jesus also teaches us here that our goal is imitation, and not just imitation, but transformation as well. Notice again how Jesus explains discipleship at the end of verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Okay? You can see that the imitation and the transformation to be like the teacher, right? You, 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 I hope you guys see that in that scripture. Think about that word again, disciple. Being someone's disciple or apprentice is about learning from that person in order to be like them. And learning from that specific person because he or she is an expert in that specific field or discipline. But if we think about discipleship in this way, then we must ask, how is Jesus an expert? Why follow him? If someone were to ask you, why should I become a student of Jesus? Do you have the answer? Well, unlike earthly masters who often excel in one skill, like painting or music or, I mean, the list goes on and on. Framing, drywall, electric, you know, the list goes on and on. And, and these are incredibly, and these people are incredibly accomplished in their ability. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our teacher, is an absolute, he is the perfect, he is absolutely perfect at his skill. In his field of expertise, what field is that? Jesus is an expert in living life in the reality of the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus said in John 8, 29, about his relationship with the Father, I always do the things that are pleasing to him, is what he said. So what, is, so what does it mean, practically, that Jesus is our teacher? Well, if Jesus is an expert at living in the reality of the kingdom of heaven, then his curriculum is going to be about that very same thing. And where do we find this curriculum? Read the book. It's found all throughout Scripture, beginning to end. Uh, there's a very good, maybe even the best example of his lesson plan, and that is found in the Sermon on the Mount. Those teachings are at the heart of what any student of Jesus should know, live, teach, Everything that should be who they are fundamentally. That is why studying Jesus's, I, I, I don't know, I call it the mountain message, Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's just so critical. That, that sermon, Jesus's magnum opus as he was walking this earth. There's so much in it that will fundamentally change us. In Matthew, so let's, let's stop for a minute and think about what we've learned. Now, in light of everything we've talked about so far, listen to this beautiful invitation in, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Folks, as your teacher, Jesus wants to correct all of our warped misconceptions about living life. He wants to do away with our corrupted wisdom that's been influenced by the world for so long. He wants to teach us about God and God's ways, the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Remember the distinctiveness of that path alone, where the world would teach, don't get mad, get even. Jesus teaches, turn the other cheek. Where the world would teach, lust is healthy. Jesus teaches lust is adultery. Where the world would teach life is about having, (laughs) Jesus teaches life is about giving it all away. Where the world would teach image is everything, Jesus teaches the heart's what matters, man. Are you a disciple of Christ? Friends, are you a student of Jesus? Listen again to what Dallas Willard says about this issue in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. First of all, we should note that being a disciple or apprentice of Jesus is a quite definite and obvious kind of thing. To make a mystery of this is to misunderstand it. There is no good reason why people should ever be in doubt as to whether they themselves are his students or not. Now, people who are asked whether they are apprentices of a leading politician, a musician, a lawyer, or a screenwriter, they don't need to think a second to respond. Similarly, for those asked if they are studying Spanish or bricklaying with someone unknown to the public, it is hardly something that would escape one's attention. The same is all more true if asked about discipleship with Jesus. Friends, you should not have to think long about that question. Many Christians today have learned that that being a disciple and being a Christian are, are two different things. But I think Scripture makes it quite quite clear that the Son of God was calling disciples and not just converts. The gospel is about God calling people to follow Jesus through the forgiveness of his cross and the power of his resurrection. Remember what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 7, man. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Friends, that's probably one of the scariest scriptures for me in the Bible, because these are people who confess Jesus is Lord with their mouth. They're deceiving themselves. Are you? Friends, this is a call to action. So let me try to summarize these things. What is a disciple of Jesus? Well, a disciple of Jesus is someone who is with Jesus in order to learn from Jesus, in order to be like Jesus. I'm going to say that again. A disciple of Jesus is someone who is with Jesus in order to learn from Jesus, in order to be like Jesus. Notice the three parts of that statement are about presence, posture, and purpose. Think about those three things. Think about how those three things have been and or should be shaping the way each of us live our life at every moment. I fail at this miserably. Presence, through prayer and the word, are you daily seeking to walk with Christ by faith? Posture. In walking with Jesus by faith, are you, are you humble and hungry, desperate to live differently? Purpose. 
Is that new path you're seeking the path of God's kingdom? Is it leading to the kingdom of heaven? Is it leading others to the kingdom of heaven? The path Jesus embodies, guys. Are you eager to become more and more like him? Please remember what Jesus himself said. Please remember his hard words. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. He, listen, he's not saying run home and throw all your important stuff, all your things in, in a trailer and go give it away. What he is saying here, though, is what in your life sits on the throne of your heart? Chew on that. Because a lot of time for me, I'm going to be frank, it's not my Lord and Savior. It's not. I fail. I am an imperfect person, man. And... And that's tough. That's tough to stand up here in front of you guys and admit. But it's the truth. This relationship is not to be entered lightly because it demands us to give up the reins. And I'm a, I, I want to be a control freak, man. Guys, this is something contrary to our very nature. Jesus said, if you are not willing to make me your one and only, first and foremost, if you are not willing to give up on your corrupt wisdom and seek, the first, and seek first the rule of God in all things, then don't do it. That's what he's saying. Don't come after me. If you can't put me on the throne of your heart, Don't bother. I don't want half of you. This is what he's saying. I want all of you. The road of discipleship is a hard road. And if we don't think it's a hard road, then we should probably be suspicious of just what road we're actually on. Where's your road lead? But, Even though it's a hard life, it is by far the best life possible. I I say it all the time to some of my closest people. My worst day as a believer is a thousand times better than my best day in the darkness. It's just, I listen. I don't know how it works, man, but it works, dude. I I just, it's crazy. Friends, yes, discipleship to Jesus is a path to becoming like Jesus. In our attitudes, our affections, our actions. But we can't ever forget where the power to change comes from. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us, and we will and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the lord are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the lord who is the spirit hmm. it's a perpetual state of transition i know that I'm better today than I was three years ago. And the, that's the work of the Holy Spirit making that transition within me. 
And I, I, I see a lot of faces out there today that I know for a fact that's been the case for you as well. Jesus became like us so that we might become like him. He died for us so that we could be freed and forgiven of our sins. So that we might choose to live for him. Only the cross and the empty tomb can give us the heart of a disciple. And only the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, can make disciples to Jesus transformative. It's not, it's not anything that, that we do besides humble ourselves before the foot of the cross, recognize how finite our proud selves actually are. He calls us to do our part. But guys, his yoke is easy. His burden is light, man. He does the heavy lifting. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for transformed lives, for, for you being the author of our salvation. Lord, these hard, this hard, hard message... <laughs> um, Lord, help us, help us to be better. Help us to be better for you. Help us to be proud and bold ambassadors in, for your message, for the gospel message to those who live in the darkness around us. Lord Jesus, I just ask protection over, over um, my friends here at Crossroads their families. <laughs> Jesse and his family. Jesus, just help us to see you throughout the moments of our week. Help us to keep you in the forefront of our minds so that we can become more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.